Before I <clears throat> share the message, I also want to recognize the people who came to uh, worship yesterday and uh, people who prayed together during the week. Uh, I believe this is the seed. Your prayers are the seed that we will harvest throughout the year of God's blessing and we truly want his blessing. So thank you for those serving hands who made all, this, all these uh, worship services during the week happen, especially today. Our brothers actually served miyokguk and it was so delicious, sorry if you missed it. But it was like a once in a lifetime kind of thing, secret ingredient there. So it was wonderful. Thank you for serving brothers. And uh, those only who had it know what I'm saying, <laughs> talking about. Let's read the word of God together. <clears throat> The second message of the new year comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's read these two verses together. Do we have both verses on the screen? Yes, okay. So let's read those uh, consecutively together. <clears throat> uh, this is the Word of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. Sweet. Are you able to see it from back there? The screen is a bit small. We'll see how it works out. Thank you. Uh, from last week, we've been talking about blessing. Now, what is this thing called God's blessing? Uh, it could be defined many ways, and I'm not here to bore you with a de uh, dictionary definition of blessing. But I'd like to sum it up as this concise, one's concise sentence. Blessing is asking for the favor of God. Blessing is the favor of God. It's asking God for a favor. Because is anybody in this room, anybody know what's going to happen to them tomorrow? They're certain how their day is going to end tomorrow. Nobody? Oh my goodness. You live so day by day, right? We all are so short-sighted. We have no knowledge or little knowledge of what is about to happen. So we have this yearning in our heart to ask favor from somebody that has a stronger hand than we do. Somebody who is almighty. We want his favor. We want his his goodness, his grace, we call it in the Bible, grace in, his, in, in our lives. Because nobody knows what will happen for certain, like in five minutes from now. I don't even know. And so we all want and desire, we thirst after this favor of an almighty being. So that's what blessing is. It is a favor of God. That is the generic definition found in the Old Testament. But as we come to the New Testament, this definition of blessing is more concrete. It's more specific. And uh, as we've been reading through the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, uh, we could probably define blessing as such. We can say blessing is something that happens when you are with Jesus. Make it very simple. Blessing is something that happens when you are with Jesus. When he is involved in our lives. The joy that happens because of Jesus. This is what we can call blessing. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach us in the Beatitudes of the, five, you know, the first verses of chapter 5. Because we have Jesus, we can be poor in the Spirit and be blessed. Because we have Jesus, although we thirst and hunger after righteousness, we will be satisfied. Because there is Jesus, we can be meek in front of the uh, violent people. Because we have Jesus, we can even be persecuted for righteousness sake, for Jesus' sake, because there is Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the fount of all our blessing. And as you and I have possessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you and I are indeed called blessed. Amen? We are blessed because of all other things, of all things, we have Jesus Christ. And that is the most amazing blessing that we have. And in fact, the Bible makes us clear 
that all blessing comes through Jesus. I don't have this verse on the screen for you, but Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. This is what uh, uh, a verse that talks about blessing of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. A bit long and wordy, but it's a saying. Every heavenly blessing is available to us if you are in Jesus Christ. He is the key to all the heavenly blessings in our lives. Amen? So the Bible is saying that all the heavenly blessing is available to us as a Christian. Now, uh, to say that all the blessings are available and to ask the question, do we enjoy, do we actually feel the blessing is a different question, right? It's all available, but do you actually enjoy, do you feel that blessing is another question. Some people enjoy the blessing of knowing that their eternity is secure in Jesus Christ. They have that blessing. Others have, know, have learned how to use the name of Jesus Christ in their prayers and get answered in their prayers that they enjoy that blessing. But others, they enjoy the blessing of even forgiving an enemy for Christ's sake. And they are confident. They have that blessing. There are even, other, even, even more others who are able to stand firm when they are persecuted. Certainly this person should be angry and mad and frustrated, but for some reason this person is so peaceful. There is even joy in persecution. Some people enjoy that blessing in their lives. So every person, every Christian, there's a different degree of how much we experience Jesus' blessing in our lives. Yes, the heavenly blessings are all available to us through Jesus Christ, but whether you experience it or not, there are varying degrees. And we want to experience more of his blessing this year. And we've been talking about how to receive, how to contain, so to speak, this heavenly blessing in our lives since last week. And we, unless we have the expectation from God that God will do great things and he, and he wants to, unless we have the expectation, unless we have this vessel to contain Jesus' blessing, you and I will never experience the fullness, the heavenly blessing that Jesus, Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 1. This morning is a continuation of last week's message. How to hold his overflowing blessing is the question. I want to ask and answer this morning. How can we hold? How can I be the person experiencing the blessing, overflowing blessing that comes from Jesus? It's done in twofold. One is emptying and the other one is filling. First, we need to empty your cup. Empty our cup. Let's say it, say it together one more time. Empty our cup. To receive this blessing, we need to empty our cup. Very simple. That's why we go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, where it says, The poor in the Spirit. Blessed are the poor in the Spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can experience the kingdom of heaven. You can receive the heavenly blessing of heaven as you are poor in the Spirit. Last week, I talked about how poor in the Spirit meant acknowledging your shortcomings in life. Acknowledging that you are, you are lacking in areas, many areas before God. That, that uh, humbleness, that uh, you, know, you need your deficiency in the Lord. Today I want to talk about another meaning of uh, poor in the Spirit. It means that we let go, we empty ourselves of our agenda and of our vision for life. That's what emptying means. What, that's what it means to empty your cup, to be poor in spirit. Jesus has taught us, and even before Jesus taught us, we kind of know by instinct that we cannot serve two masters. As you read further along in the Sermon on the Mount, we we come to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, where Jesus makes this very clear. He says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. There are two things, one or the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In effect, Jesus is saying, you cannot multitask with your heart. Maybe you could do multitask, get your work with the computers and your gadgets, but you cannot multitask with your heart. You can have either or. You either are pursuing God, 
or you're pursuing money, you're pursuing the world. Where is your agenda this year? What is your real prayer request? Is it something about God? Or is it money? As we are unclear on this issue, if we are unclear on this issue, we cannot expect to receive the heavenly blessing that uh, the Bible is talking about. I read a story about <clears throat> lion tamers, right? How do you tame a wild lion? A lion that's roaring and about to devour you and it's just, just caught, captured from the wild. I don't know if it's legal to do that anymore, but uh, how can you tame a lion? And it's rather simple, they say. You, you kind of probably saw it before, like a circus or some other setting, uh, a safari or whatnot. Uh, the tamer would t bring out a chair, a four-legged chair, and kind of in his face, in the lion's face. You know, it's roaring, it's about to attack you, but it shows the four legs of the chair. And they say the lion gets confused because the, the lion, the cat, is really uh, always aggressive and focused and attacked one thing of the prey. But he sees four legs. Oh, should I attack the left leg? Or oh, the right leg looks good too. And it gets confused. And in all the confusion, uh, the, the chair is always, again in its face. And in the process, he gets tamed. That's uh, the uh, uh, thing I read. And I thought it was very interesting. You know, Satan has given many things, many legs in our heart. Many tempting things for us to pursue after. God, I want that too. I want that too. I need that too in my life. I want this and that and that. Envious, jealous. We have so many things in our hearts, including money, and Satan prevents us from emptying the things of the world. We want to possess. We want to claim. We want to have it. We want the money. And so... Our hearts are soon filled with our own agenda, our ambitions, our vision, and our dreams. And if our hearts are filled with all these things, where is there room for God's agenda? Where is there room for kingdom vision? Where is there room for God's blessing? Our vision, our focus must be razor sharp. And I pray that it will be razor sharp on focusing on Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen. That we would want nothing but, but Jesus in our hearts. You know, actually, the, the disciples uh, had to make this decision too, to empty their agenda and their vision. Because we recall, this is chapter 5, but chapter 4, Jesus called out the fishermen that He was passing by in the Sea of Galilee, this lake. Jesus said to, uh, to, to Peter, right? Peter the rock, come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. He, he called out Andrew, his brother, come, I will make you fishers of men. And they started to follow Jesus. After a little while, Jesus went to another side of the lake and he met two other brothers, sons of Zebedee, James and John. And he says, come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And they saw who Jesus was, and they trusted him and followed Jesus. But do you think it was an unconditional following of Jesus? Do you think uh, they could just follow Jesus just uh, over their just emotion and whim? Can, you, can they do that? No. The Bible is very specific, says that they left their nets to follow Jesus. They even left their boat to follow Jesus. And oh my goodness, they even left their father. To follow Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus un unless you empty of your stuff, of our possessions, our passions, ambitions in life. For us to enjoy the blessing of Jesus that he has for, in store for us this year, maybe I could put it this way, we need to let go of our prayer requests that uh, we have, the priorities. You know, the things that we write at the beginning of the year, if you do. Um, we have to let those things go. Because if we are filled with things for our career, and we are, have all these things for our children and family, for our lives, God cannot fill our lives with His agenda, His vision for us. 
unless we let go of the important things in our lives, God cannot fill our lives with the important things of His in our lives. I talked to a teenager now recently. I can't reveal the person who that is. And uh, she, uh, she was frustrated in, in school. And she said she was frustrated and she felt bad. I said, what's going on? And uh, she said, this is her story. She says uh, she's been given a group project, right? Have you done those group projects before where you have to work together with others, right? Usually we get individual grades and you, know, you do well, you work for your grade and you get a good grade, that's how it works. But uh, you're working on a group project and this, this, uh, this girl was frustrated because, and she said, uh, I was teamed up with uh, two other boys and they were not doing their share. And uh, I even told them what to do, and you, know, you have to do this, I have to do that, and we have to put it together. But she was so frustrated because she did everything she could, and, you know, uh, working hard, you know, Asians do. Uh, and, and these other boys were not. So she went to the teacher and said, teacher, you know, I've done so much work, and, you know, I know it's a group project, but my, my teammates, uh, they're not there. I tried. And the teacher said, don't worry about it. I'll grade you guys individually, even though it's a group project. And then I asked her, why were you, why did you feel bad though? And this is what she said. What, after that, the teacher told her this, you know, it's okay, actually, I put you guys together so that you could be some kind of an influence on these other boys. I know they weren't doing their work very well. I was hoping that maybe they could learn from you a little bit. And now she felt really bad because she was complaining and grumbling about her, her teammates, not knowing that there was a, a bigger picture, a bigger plan by the teacher for her. Brothers and sisters, I hope we don't end up like that in heaven. We've been so focused on the project, the task that we have for our daily lives, and we're really good at it. But when you get to heaven, God says, I was hoping that you would be a good influence on your teammates. Because... Grades, middle school grades, do you still keep your middle school grades? They're all gone. It's everything for that person right now, but it's all gone. It, the, it's the relationships that's, that last. And even heaven, all the things that we, we think important right now will all be nothing. But the people of God, the people God put, us around, put around us, that was the true agenda of God. I hope we don't someday feel bad because we couldn't and comprehend and embrace the agenda of God. Brothers and sisters, for us to receive the blessing of Jesus this year, the heavenly blessing that he talks about, we need to empty our cup of plans, empty our cup of our agenda and our own vision. This can be so hard and even scary to let go of our plans. But when we do, if we do let it go before him, not because it's worthless, but because we value him more. If we let it go, we will be so uncertain about our future and we'll be more reliant and really pray one thing to God, that God, you are the one that could work out my life every day. I look to you. And isn't it the promise of God, of Jesus Christ himself, that seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto us. And there was no need to worry at the end. We'll find out. God takes care of the birds of, of the field and all the animals of the world. Will he not care for his children? That's what Jesus is teaching in his, in his Sermon on the Mount. So what is there to not let go? Empty our cups of, a cup of plans this year, I pray. As we empty the cup of my, our agenda, empty the cup of our vision, empty the cup of our hearts, we will truly experience the poorness, the poor of spirit. And you and I, we will experience this heaven, the kingdom of God that Jesus promised that he would give to us. So first step for us to experience and contain the blessing of God this year is to empty our agenda. Let, let go and let God, as they say, let him take over every day. You know, uh, until a couple of years, I used to have all these prayer requests. I'm talking about myself, actually, when I preach this. I used to have all these prayer requests for my personal requests, family requests, for my uh, ministry, for my health, and for my you know, self-advancement. I had all these cat categories meticulously you know, laid out and, you know, and asked God for favor and all that. 
But uh, last year I ditched it. <laughs> last year we were praying that Holy Spirit, would you lead us uh, with your word? Can you lead us? Will lead me, Lord, and and experience you in a fresh way that I would never even ask for. And God has taken care of my life. And it's my same, same prayer because this, this year that Holy Spirit would take over my life. In order to do that, we have to let go of our vision, of our plans, of our cup. We have to empty our cup. That's the phase, first phase. And second phase is we need to expect God to fill it. Fill the, the cup with something. And uh, as, as a continuation of last week's sermon, said, let us fill our cups with the grace of worship. And now, this morning, we like to say that let us fill our cup with a life of witness. This is a blessing in our lives. And we come to uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When our lives are empty of our agenda and our plans, God starts to work in our lives. And last week we saw from Psalm chapter 23, verse 5, that God fills our life with worship. And we become faith, we have a Holy Spirit in our lives, and we hear Him, and we have faith to walk each day in faith. The second blessing that we aspire, we pray for, is the, uh, the blessing of the lifetime of witness. This is not, probably something that, not something that you have thought about or experienced much. But think about it, Jesus, after He has lived his life here on this earth. He finished his ministry. He taught. He, he uh, healed. He uh, preached. And at the end, he died on the cross. He resurrected, fulfilling the salvation work that he had come to accomplish. And after he had resurrected and he spent 40 days on this earth with his disciples, he gave his last will and testament, so to speak. And that verse that we read in chapter 1, verse 8, is very, that very statement. And Jesus, after showing us what the kingdom of God is like, he wants to fill us with what that means to live the kingdom dream. And the very last sentence of his, his uh, word on this earth reveals that, what he wants to fill us with. Go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The takeaway here is... Uh, as we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be Jesus' witnesses. Jesus' vision for us, what Jesus wanted to fill us with, was his mission to be, uh, for, for us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. That was what Jesus wanted to fill us with, our passion with, with our life with. We, our lives need to be filled with this, uh, this uh, mission to be the, uh, the witness of Jesus Christ. But how? Going back to the same verse, it says, uh, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes, right? When we receive the Holy Spirit, when we follow the Holy Spirit, when we are led by the Holy Spirit, as a result, blah, 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 we will be witnesses. Jesus is witnesses. That's what the, the logic is. Last year, we've uh, focused on this so much. God, we want to experience and be led by the Holy Spirit. And so we focused quiet time, we focused Bible study, we focused understanding what the Word of God has for us so we could be led and we could obedi obey what God has to say. But that is not the end to itself. There is a purpose. There's a reason that God blesses us. There's a reason that the Holy Spirit leads us. There's a, a, a destination. And this verse gives us the very des destination. And it is to be... Jesus is witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the blessing Jesus wanted us wanted to bless us with. In other words, if you're filled with the Spirit, your life is full of witnessing Jesus Christ. What is a witness? Let's think about that a little bit. What is this witness that Jesus is talking about? Just a gen general definition might be this. Uh, a witness is someone who testifies what they've experienced firsthand for the benefit of somebody else. Sometimes it could be yourself, but most of the time when you're at a court setting and you're called as a witness, you're there on behalf of somebody else. You're there on behalf to, to tell the truth, uh, to reveal truth for someone's sake, to save somebody's lives sometimes, right? Witness is a very important person. When we become a witness of Jesus Christ, 
we become a channel of blessing to someone else as we profess, testify what God has done in our lives. As we testify who Jesus is, it is benefiting somebody else. In other words, a witness is somebody is as a channel of blessing to someone else. When I think of uh, a witness, a uh, benefit of witness, I think of this, this story. Some of you heard this story about my wife. She was in a car accident, right? A couple of years ago, she was making uh, this left turn at the signal light. And uh, it was green, green arrow. And so she was making the turn. And all of a sudden, uh, this car from the other side came and slammed into the car and hit the passenger side and it knocked out the bumper. And you know, thankfully and luckily, you know, nobody was hurt. But uh, she needed to find out what happened. So they stopped the car. Both parties stopped the car, got on the curve, side of the road, and talked about it. And the other lady said, Lady, you, you ran a red light. You ran a red light to my wife. So she was at fault, and the other person was innocent. And uh, there was no cameras, right? You know, we didn't have those cameras on the dash, whatever. How would she prove it? It was a very awkward in, uh, situation because the other party was conflicting with what my wife had experienced. But then a car behind my wife's car stopped alongside with her and came out and testified. You know, I was watching right behind you and this lady who's making the left turn, we, we, we both together made the legal left turn on the green light. You ran the red light. And so after that, you know, it wasn't settled, but she uh, gave her contact information and she offered herself to be a witness to the scene. And uh, the two insurance companies fought after like a whole year. And we won, actually. Uh, and the uh, essential element of the winning was that there was a witness, a third party not involved, third party who was witness, uh, witnessed what happened and told the truth. I realized how wonderful witnesses are, how important a witness are. So I don't have to pay for all the insurance on, for, for her. I was so thankful. I believe to become a witness of Jesus Christ is somewhat similar. Because many people, many, many people in the world are suffering under the lie of Satan. Satan comes and hits us with, with his lies all the time. Whenever there is an opportunity, he is trying to drive a wedge. It's this, this conflict between us and God. He makes us doubt the love of God. When something wrong, bad happens in our lives, uh, something uh, hurtful thing happens in our lives, Satan makes us doubt the love of God. Does God still love you? In fact, does he even exist? Does he care? When in fact, God is everywhere. Unless he protects us, we cannot live one day. But Satan lies and we are deceived. Satan says, because he doesn't love you, you need to be in charge of the steering wheel of your life. And as a result, we all believed that lie once. Because we all believed that, believed that lie, we all commit the sin of being the, my own Lord, master of my life. Satan has daily, is even today, continually attacking us with the doubt about the love of God. And if we continue to listen to those doubts and lies, we cannot but live in despair and suffering because we have to take care of everything. What do we need at that point? What we need in that situation is a witness of Jesus Christ. A witness, a third person that comes and says, No, Jesus loves you. Somebody that says, God is our salvation. God is our rock of salvation. Somebody that comes and tells the truth about what they've experienced about God. A witness of Jesus Christ is somebody who has been saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. A witness is somebody who has experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they are living out their life with the resurrected, resurrected Lord. A witness is someone that has deeply experienced the love of God, and experiencing every day, and they cannot but share that love. If you have experienced the love of Jesus, 
you and I are witnesses of Jesus Christ. We must remember that the purpose for the grace and blessing, we love these words, right? In our lives of worship and the joy, it's not the end to itself. If we truly read the heart, the words of Jesus, He wants us to be, the, as after we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, He wants us to be the witnesses to those who are living in deceit, who are uh, in doubt of God's love. Brothers and sisters, let us fill our cups of witnessing. Um, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you, know, you know that uh, some of us go out to the community just to bless and to talk about God. It's amazing that how few people, you know, there are some people that have never, I mean, they know the word of Jesus, name Jesus, but they, they have never heard what Jesus has done for them. They've never understood what the cross meant. They never understood the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is just amazing that we think we hear every day, you know, it's like, you know, in our hearts, it's like nailed to our hearts and we hear, we heard it all our lives, but there are people have never heard this message that, that is so important. We need to fill our lives with this lifestyle of witnessing. What, is, what does it mean to fill our lives, our cups of witnessing? It means that we are willing to let the Word of God flow through our lives. What you and I have heard, what you have not experienced, that Word of God, let it flow through us to somebody else. It means that you and I are willing and committed to be a channel of blessing to someone else. Maybe we could apply this to what uh, the Bible says here. It says, be a witness to Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Our Jerusalem, where is our Jerusalem? I want to apply it to our home. We can be a witness. You can be a witness to your family members as you have your uh, family worship or I don't know if you're away, you know, um, your kids are away, you could text them and say, you know, this is what mom and dad has read this morning. And this touched my heart. And I pray for you because of this. As we let it flow, let the word of God flow in our hearts. And as we become a witness of God's word, this becomes a joyful blessing in our lives. Your kids want to hear what God has been doing in your life. Your kids want to know if they can still, they can also uh, live as a Christian uh, looking at your life. And uh, we need to testify, we need to be a bit witness to our Jerusalem, our homes. We also need to be a witness in uh, Judea. Uh, I want to apply this to our small group meetings. As we gather in our small group meetings, it's not just about listening and learning about God, but it is also sharing with others what God has done for you this week. How this word has touched you. As you say it from your heart and from your lips, it'll touch somebody else's life and give them confirmation in their faith to help them continue on, encourage them to continue on to live for Jesus Christ as well. Last year, as I was sharing my quiet time with some of the brothers at my church, uh, I was blessed so much. It confirmed my faith and encouraged their faith. We were able to really experience God at another level. I encourage and I bless that we would be able to share our quiet times and what God has said to you, maybe in the worship service, with your small group, with your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. We also need to be witnesses in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. As I said, many, many people around in this community have, are being deceived. They say all paths lead to salvation. Jesus is just one of them. They are believing in this lie. And unless there is a witness who has experienced the true salvation through Jesus Christ, how would they know? How would they get out from the lie of the, of the uh, adversary? We have many people to be a witness to in our community and to the world. But specifically, I want you to uh, ponder upon this one question as we conclude the message. Who is your one? Who is your one this year? Who is that one person that you need to be a witness to this year? Somebody that would never hear what Jesus has done for them unless you become a witness. Who is that one person? It could be a person that I would never have access to. It will be a person that only you, God has put to you, give, given to you to be a witness uh, to. Who is your one? 
Brothers and sisters, when we talk about witnessing Jesus Christ to people around us, it might be a little bit of a burden for all of us. And, uh, you know, this is a challenge for us. When it's not a challenge that I conjured up, it is a challenge that the Bible explicitly, it's coming from the heart of Jesus Christ. Brothers, would would we not pray for that one thing? That God, I am not all that. I am not, I don't know the Bible so well. I'm not so close to you to be like, you know, some of the apostles or even some of the pastors. But God, I want to be a witness too. I want to experience this. I want to, you know, I've received blessing from you, the worship service, the word of God. And why can't I be a witness for your kingdom? Be it such a small effort, but let me be a, a witness to my kids. Let me be a witness to my coworker. Let me be a witness to my cousin, who is always under the oppression of sin, of Satan. Brothers and sisters, let us empty our cups of our plans in order to be filled with a cup of witnessing. And as we do, we will experience another level a blessing this year. I pray that we will all experience that blessing, the blessing of being a channel of blessing to others, a blessing of being a witness for Christ's sake. And someday, one day, we'll be in heaven and we'll see the bigger picture. Oh, yes, Lord, you have put that person for a reason and I, was, I emptied my plan and made time for them because you've called me. We'll enjoy the banquet feast, not here, but in heaven. And uh, know that we are children of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray to our Lord at this time.